Rain in Spain means Verstappen is a bloody pain. I think that's how that goes, right? Hey there guys, I'm Will. Welcome to FP1 and the Comedy Review, the series that last week beat the F1 highlights. I think you'll find FOM have stolen my content this time. I'll be sending a copyright strike in due course. I'm basically asking for this video to be taken down, aren't I? Anyway, after Monaco was surprisingly good, the F1 circus headed to Catalonia for the Spanish Grand Prix, a country famous for people who think it's a clever idea to pick a fight with an angry bull. Kinda sums up F1 at the moment, doesn't it? With rain in the air though, could someone maybe just take the fight to Max Verstappen? I mean, we've already established after last week that it won't be Checo. Before we dive into things, I'm going to quickly get on my knees and beg you to like and subscribe. Now let's get into the comedy review for the Spanish Grand Prix. Let's kick things off with... What the hell is going on here? Oh, mamma mia. And the big headline coming into the weekend was that F1 had done the impossible and made a change that people actually liked. The Spanish Grand Prix in the past has usually been about as interesting as having a conversation with Lawrence Stroll. Though ahead of the race this year, the organizers agreed to revert the layout back to the death trap we last raced on in 2006. Though everyone has welcomed the changes, some are surprised the FIA have gone back on a move that was originally made under safety grounds. My argument for that would be, I think the FIA stopped caring about safety when they let Roy Nassani race in Formula 2. Also in the news, Sky Sports have announced a new F1 broadcast aimed at children, or in other words, Lando Norris fans. Rumour has it that these broadcasts will come with new sound effects and graphics, probably telling you what proportion of Colt LH are sending death threats on Twitter as the race progresses. There really wasn't much else doing the rounds in the F1 paddock, so let's not waste any more time and dive straight into FP1. Verstappen dominating the session to the surprise of literally no one. What maybe was a surprise was the return of everyone's favourite porpoising. F1 cars taking Pride Month to a whole new meaning and having intercourse with the Barcelona tarmac. Several teams had updated their liveries in an effort to make it look like their big corporations actually gave a damn. Logan Sargent, though, may have taken things a little bit too far when he, by his own admission, touched Pierre Gasly. Alpine were actually having a good session, P3 and 5 for Rocon and Pierre as they tried to build off their Monaco podium last week and keep Laurent Rossi in his anger management classes. An FP2 would be more of the same, with Verstappen still on top, though Alonso was much closer in P2. F1 fans spent Friday coming up with all the ways the number 33 coincided with the weekend, Fernando of course chasing that elusive 33rd race win. Let's be real though, the only way that's happening is if a sniper takes out the old car 33 mid-race, and even then, I think a brainless Verstappen would still dominate the Grand Prix by three minutes. Nico Hülkenberg and Haas seemed on the pace for once. P3 for the German, which was probably helped by the new Mercedes and Ferrari upgrades, somehow sending them backwards. We wouldn't get a chance to validate this come Saturday morning though, as we found out that the 19 fastest drivers in the world, and a Formula E world champion, were all a little bit scared of some water. Logan Sargent, at least, was brave enough to venture out onto the circuit. In, in hindsight, maybe you, maybe you should have stayed inside, mate. We came into Quali then, a little in the dark. We knew Verstappen would take pole, obviously, but behind him it was a bit of a lottery. Add to that a damp track from earlier, Q1 was about to get spicy. First off the road was Yuki Tsunoda, who was soon followed in the spin by his own teammate. Nick DeVries enjoying this so much, he decided he'd just do it again. DeVries was confused and asked what he was doing wrong probably thinking you could jump into a Formula 1 car. Fernando Alonso, meanwhile, had a huge snap at the final corner, wrecking his floor and actually giving Lance Stroll the chance for once. And we're not even done. Valtteri Bottas continued to drive like he was half his age, and by that I mean he was driving like he was still a rookie. And then Logan Sargent lost it and spun into the gravel. Oh, hang on, no, that was Alex Albon. Sorry. Force a habit. At this point, F1 threw out the red flag just to stop the drivers from embarrassing themselves any further. That wouldn't save Charles Leclerc though, the monogast taking his new Ferrari upgrades and failing to make it out of Q1. Leclerc was later taken to the medical centre, probably for a severe case of depression. Okay, in all seriousness, this was actually for a doping test, though you'd think qualifying 19th in the Ferrari is proof against performance enhancing drugs enough. More shocks would come in Q2, Sergio Perez taking the fight to Max Verstappen. 
Um, kidding, he went straight into the gravel. He got one more shot at getting out of the drop zone and proceeded to bottle that as well. And would be joined on the sidelines by Mercedes George Russell, who tried to take the team back to the glory days when he crashed into Lewis Hamilton. With three big names out of the top 10 shootout that allow for some surprise midfield contenders to squeeze their way in. This included the two McLarens, Nico Hülkenberg and Lance Stroll. Come Q3 though, the Canadian would actually manage to out-qualify his more experienced teammate for the first time in 2023. Let's just ignore that floor damage for a second. Pierre Gasly would also have a solid performance, P4 for Alpine, until footage emerged of him trying to add the chicane back into the circuit to Catalonia, not once, but twice. That's about it for qualifying. Oh, and of course Verstappen took pole. Is that really a shock though? We've got drivers further back out of position for the race, so maybe we've set up a classic in the battle for P2. At least I'm more sure about the sponsor of this video, and it's a big thank you once again to head out. F1's a great sport to watch on TV, but the experience track side is really something else. Problem is, these tickets are expensive, and usually a little more than the pennies you'll find down the back of the sofa. That's where head out come in. They provide the best prices and seats when it comes to attending F1 Grand Prix, and also offer a range of other experiences on their website. They also regularly run ticket giveaways where you can secure huge discounts on your race tickets, or even if you're lucky, get them completely for free. We're well into the European leg of the championship now, so if you'd like to grab your tickets for any of those races, head to the link in the description below. You can also use the code FP130 for 30% off your purchase, which I'll admit really helps me out as well. Now then, let's get into Grand Prix Sunday. Sainz and Verstappen would get an even start off the line, the Dutchman fending off the Spaniard as 20 cars hurtled towards Turn 1. You're probably wondering why I've not spoken about Lando Norris getting into P3 in quali. I mean, I do exude British bias after all. Well, I didn't feel like there was any need, given he drove into the back of Hamilton at Turn 1 and dropped to the rear of the field. Lance Stroll was then able to slide past Lewis into third, not a sentence I thought I'd be saying after Monaco, I'll be honest. Hamilton was soon able to get back past on lap 8, and fair play to him for getting by without being ran into. The W14 was actually performing very well, and soon enough, Hamilton was on the rear of Carlos Sainz for second, or first place in Formula Nova Stappen. Ferrari chose then to pit the Spaniard, and while he questioned, understandably, those orders, Hamilton would wait till lap 25 before coming into the pits himself and hunting after the homeboy. Could always be worse though, you could be Charles Leclerc. He'd had his whole car rebuilt overnight, though this was doing bugger all for his pace. Ferrari's strategy, having his hard tyre stint last only 17 laps, probably wasn't helping either. Strategy wasn't being kind to Carlos Sainz either, as Hamilton sailed past the Ferrari on lap 28, though the other Mercedes of George Russell then dropped a bombshell that he reported rain falling at turn 5. Maybe this could be the added spice we needed. Maybe Verstappen would slide off in the damp conditions and actually wake me up. Never mind, this was just George Russell's sweat. The Briton at least had remembered how to drive after Saturday, sweeping past Sainz and making it two Mercedes on the podium. I'll be honest, very little happened for the rest of the race. Ocon nearly killed Alonso when Perez tried to battle his way back onto the podium, resulting in a closing lap duel with Georgie Boy here. I say that, but the moment Perez looked like he might be competent, he decided to be Sergio Perez again. But hey, at least we get a double Merc podium. There was no stopping Verstappen, however. He pitted to cover off the 16-second lead he had to Hamilton, then stormed to another victory to extend his championship lead. He even took the fastest lap point away from Checo, as if he hadn't already suffered enough. If at this stage you still think Perez can challenge for the title, you really are a special human being. However, it was nice to see Mercedes back near the front, though it would help if both them and Aston could get it right on the same weekend and give us more of a battle to look forward to. Ferrari, meanwhile, I have no words anymore. If you enjoyed the comedy review, though, I'd appreciate it if you dropped it a like and got subscribed for more in the future. We've got IndyCar at Detroit tonight, which should kick up a bit more action than this, so you won't want to miss it. Cheers once again to Head Out for sponsoring this video and to all my patrons and channel members for supporting me and the channel. If you want to get involved in that, all the links you need are down in the description below. I'll be seeing you very soon with that IndyCar comedy review, but until then, have a good one.